absolutely awesome. We have so much talent in this church. And, um, this week we lost one of our own, uh, Brother Ralph Chapman, passed away, church member for over 90 years. Can I say, oh me? Amen. Uh, how many of y'all want to break that record? Not me. Bradley, you can, you can stay here as long as you want. I'm going home before then. <laughs> Amen. I am looking forward to the place that the Lord has prepared for me. But, uh, Eddie, we will keep you in our prayers. And uh, you, uh, you have a good legacy of blessing. And uh, this church is blessed to have uh, had such uh, a member to uh, touch our lives and Bradley did a great job. Mark did a, a great job with the service, and Petra and Broadus and Mark sang, and it was it was uh, an honor to uh, have been a part of it. If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter eighteen. When you get there, stay there, but look in Matthew chapter number twenty six, and we're going to uh, look in God's Word there as well. John chapter 18. I love to hear the pages turning. You know, everybody looks at their phones now because they have the Bible on their phone. And by the way, I believe that's a good thing. Used to, used to be the greatest sound that you ever saw was the, or you ever heard was the, the turning of pages, you know, when everybody was looking at God's Word. Now you can say it's the glow on their face from as they look into their phone. And it. John chapter 18. Verse 1, when Jesus said, oh, would you stand with me in honor of reading God's word? Sorry. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Uh, by the way, often went there to have a time of fellowship, but often went there to pray. He knew that's what he would be doing. Verse 3, Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, huge phrase, he knew this, and yet he was there. He went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with him. And when he said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. They were so shocked and surprised when he said, the I am. But the phrase added to it, I am the one, I am he. Then he asked them again, whom are you seeking? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let those go their way, that the same might be fulfilled which he spoke. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Hear this phrase, shall I not drink the cup which my Father has given me? Let's pray. Father, I pray that in the next few moments that um, by the power of your Spirit, Jesus will be high and lifted up. I pray, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be pleasing unto you. Lord, Holy Spirit, that you would amen those words, your words, into the heart. Father, give us the vision to see the cup, not as we would think about it, but Lord, as Jesus saw it and knew, and yet was so willing to go and drink of this cup. Father, bless this day as we are before your table. I pray that the Holy Spirit would burn deep within our heart, that we would, with ears to hear, listen to you. Father, I pray that today we would be drawn close, and for it will be the better, 
and we'll give you the praise. In your name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. If you would, if you would just turn to Matthew chapter number 26 now. We'll end back up in John 18, but this in Matthew's account, we see the Lord on that beginning of the Passover week. I wonder when our Lord left heaven, he knew that he would have to come as a child and he went to Bethlehem and was born of the Virgin Mary. Joseph, his basically his stepfather, would be there to be there with him to, as every child needs a, a parent to guard and to love. He knew that he came and the God of eternity stepped into life and even at that moment death was there when we go to the hospital and we go to the to the wing of the hospital where all the children are born it's a it's a place of balloons not like Sheila's that pop but it's it's a place of celebration and ribbons and the smiles upon the mothers as they finally say it is over it is finished <laughs> but but yet that's just the beginning. But even from the start of life, we understand that even though then life may be beginning, death will come because it is appointed to man once to die. The statistics are right. Unless God comes back and interrupts us with the rapture of the church, we'll go the same way as so many have gone, like Brother Ralph went before us this week. And we'll... Absent from body, present with the Lord. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if he's your Savior, if he's the Lord of your life, if he's your master, if you put your life into his hands, then you'll be like the song the choir sang, he touched you, and you'll be in the presence of God, and what a wonderful time that would be that the Almighty God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, would be there to welcome us home. Welcome home, good and faithful servant. But in this life, the smell of death is always there. And in chapter 26, you see it especially because Jesus knew what was coming. Look in verse 1. It came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings that he said to his disciples, you know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. This is not the first time he said it. But he's reminded them over and over again. This was simply about the fulfilling of the Passover. He knows that he is going to Jerusalem. He will give his life a ransom. Understand this. He knows the cross is coming. And yet he goes. And he goes willingly. Verse 6. When Jesus was in Bethlehem at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came into him, having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head, and he sat at the table, as he sat at the table. Look what he says in verse 10. Why do you trouble the woman? For she's done a good work for me, for you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. It seems that Mary was one of the few that was listening when Jesus said over and over again, we're going to Jerusalem. I will be taken by the chief priest. I will be crucified. I will be buried, but I will rise again the third day. So the things of earth lost its value to her. The thing that meant the most to her was Christ. And she came and anointed him for his burial. This was something that was done after death. But yet, she knew that it must be done before. Look in verse 17. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house 
with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. He basically said, they said, where, where will we eat it? He said, go to a certain place. And everything that he told them is exactly the way that they found it. They just followed his words, and when they went to the place, it was exactly as he said it. It was prepared beforehand. He knew it, and yet he yielded to it. From the time before the creation of the world, he knew what we would be, sinners. He knew that he desired a relationship with us, and something would have to bridge that gap between a holy God and a wretched sinner like you and I are. Before Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created. He knew the price of life and yet went through the process. Pastor, could he have, could he have done something else? Could he have gone another way? Sure he could have. But he chose love for us. He chose a way for us. Not only did he cho choose it, he had to walk it out. Love does. Love is not talk. Love is action. It's not just that he prepared it. He was willing to fulfill it. Not just the, the good parts, the hard parts. Most of the time today, I don't mean this rudely, but we've gotten a little spoiled. We want the good part without, without ever having to go through the bad part. We want the blessing without ever having to go through the, the take up your cross daily and follow me. We want heaven. We want the healing. We want the joy. We want the fulfillment. But yet, we want it our way, which is a road of pleasantness. And ease. But as we look at the life of, cross, it, of, of Christ, it was not the life of ease. It was planned. It was planned. He gathered with his disciples in that upper room to take the cross, or take the, the Passover with them. You know he had to think about the week. The triumphal entry where people were praising him. And he was saying, they're praising me with their lips, but are they praising me with their hearts? So he went on for the week. He met with them in the temple. All the questions that they asked, and he answered. The Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, the Herodians came and tried to trick him up. But he was patient. Long-suffering and kind. Listen to me. He would die for them too. Not just for the ones that we think of are worthy. Nobody's worthy of the blood of Christ. But yet he was willing. He answered their questions. He knew their plotting. He knew what Judas was trying to do. All that week, he saw all the people. People from all over the world would come together for Passover celebration. All the different nations, the colors, the languages, the smiles, the frowns. I wonder how many people. He looked into their eyes, and he knew that he came to save their souls. The value of a life. Church, please listen to me. The value of your life. The world may put up its standard and say that you don't matter. You're not smart enough. You're not beautiful enough. You're not talented enough. You're not hardworking enough. The world may look at you and say, you have to match us, but I want you to know Christ came to do it for you. Where you are, as you are, he created you the way that you are, knowing that you would be a sinner. Can I say it in Brian's way? Knowing that you're stupid. And yet he loved me anyway. 
knowing that I would turn my back upon him many times, but yet he would love me through that, beyond that. And as he was with his disciples, verse 26, as they were eating, Jesus took the, the bread. He blessed it, listen to me now, and broke it. He knew what was coming. And he gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Verse 27, then he took the cup <laughs> and gave thanks. He took the cup and looks into that cup and he sees the wine in the cup. Listen to me, church. He knew the grapes. He made it this way. He was the creator God. He knew that the grapes to become wine would have to be crushed. And as the grapes are crushed, that which is inside would come out. He knew the wine press. They would be placed there and it would be turned and the, it would be squeezed down. A slow, deliberate process. And the juice would flow. When he took the bread and he broke it, he knew it was his body on the cross that would be broken. When he took the cup and looked in it and gave thanks he knew that it was his life that would be crushed. This is, verse 27, drink from it, all of you. He gave thanks and he gave it to them. Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, the new testament, the way, the living way, the truth the living out of the truth, the life, the abundant life that he came to give us. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. I must be crushed. Then he walks from the upper room. Look at verse 37. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he went to the, they're in there at the Garden of Gethsemane. He began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed, and he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful. The God of joy and peace and love his soul is being crushed, even to death, it says. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed. He fell on his face, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. If we need to be faithful to the exegesis of Scripture, he means exactly what he says in verse 39. If it is possible, let this cup pass. I don't want it. He was human like we are, and he didn't want to be crushed. And yet, he knew this was his purpose. Nevertheless, not my will. Your will be done. He went back to the disciples and found them asleep. He said, could you not pray with me one hour? He went back and prayed. Listen to me now. Said the same words. This cup can pass for me. He went back and found the disciples asleep again. Listen to me. He went a third time to pray. And it says, I believe it's verse 44, he said the same words, and yet he knew. 
And he came back. Found them. It is the price of our salvation. The soldiers were there. We read it in John 18. <laughs> they couldn't believe that he was kind. How could you smile and love the ones that are taking you that will treat you so badly? And I, I was amazed by this because when, when Peter and human nature reaches in, he had the sword, and I think, I think, be honest, I think he's trying to cut the guy's head off. He is swinging at him, and I believe the guy ducked because he cut off his ear. You don't just go and take off the ear. I'll teach you. I'll take your ear off. I think he's trying to take his head off. The Lord stopped it and said, no, put the sword up. He even took time to heal the soldier, put his ear back on. But he turns to Peter, and listen to this phrase, shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Shall I not be crushed? And they beat him. And his face would be cut, brutally beaten, mocked, slapped. They beat him with rods. They taunted him. They put the crown of thorns on his head. I wonder what he felt when the blood dripped down into his eyes. They took the cat of nine tails, those strips of leather that had rock and glass in it, and they tied him there. You can only give them 39 stripes because they thought if they give you 40 stripes, they'll kill you. But literally, they're taken to the verge of death there to, to inflict the most punishment that they can. They hit, they, they would tie him to the, to the post, a person behind it, skilled at doing this, would whip him, it would reach around the post, it would hit his back, and he would pull it to pull the flesh off, and the blood would flow. Isaiah says that this is old King James. His visage was so marred. Literally, his body was so bruised and so beaten that you could not look at him and even recognize who he was. He was a swollen, bloody mess. That they took, he was so weak physically, he could not even bear the cross all the way up to Golgotha. He fell beneath the weight of the load. You know as a man, you know if there was any way possible, he would have carried it all the way up. But he never said a word. Because he knew he had to drink this cup. He knew he had to be crushed. They put him on that cross. They crucified him there. And all he could say was, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. The love of God was there. And today, I accept the love of God. I accept the gift from Christ. I accept the forgiveness. I'm not worthy of it, but I accept the forgiveness that comes from Christ. I'm grateful and I accept His mercy. I accept His companionship lo I will never leave you I accept the gifts of life that he's given me a precious wife and three children I accept your friendship non-deserving of it but I love you and I thank you for it Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And folks, I accept that heaven is my home. I accept and know that this world is not my home. I wasn't built. I was built to die. But that's the only way that you can live. And when I was a 10-year-old child, I found the end of myself and I found the beginning of him. And I accepted that salvation full and free. But listen, 
I also accept the cup that he has for me. And I pray that you accept the cup that he has for you. Today we will partake of the Lord's Supper. This is for those who are believers. You cannot partake of that for which you have never accepted into your own life. You've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. I pray that you do. Christians were supposed to take this worthily too. That means we should accept the forgiveness that only God can give us. But church, are you living for you or are you willing to accept the cup that he has for you too? That's what you're saying up here. As his body was broken for you, as his blood was shed for you, are you willing to receive the cup that he has for you too? Are you willing to be crushed for his glory? Romans 12 says we're supposed to come. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Are you willing today to come and take that cup and say, I will live for him, I will serve him?